Well, again, I do want to welcome you to the session, and I want to welcome our panelists uh, today uh, in this regional session. Um, we have, uh, in fact, a, a very distinguished panel, a set of panelists, um, and I'll introduce them. Dan Dorman, uh, who is the regional administrator for Region 1, Vic McCree, who is the regional administrator for Region 2, Cindy Peterson, who's the regional administrator for Region 3, and Mark DePaul, who is the regional administrator for Region 4. And on my other side, we have Randy Eddington, who is the executive vice president, chief nuclear officer for Arizona Public Service Company, and Joe Grimes, who is the executive vice president, chief nuclear officer for Tennessee Valley Authority. So welcome, uh, panelists, uh, to the session also. So as I indicated, uh, the format for this session is really a question and answers. Um, we, uh, I prepared to start uh, that session off with a number of questions uh, for the panelists, but we really intend in the session to elicit your questions um, so the panelists can respond to things that are of interest to you. So again, please uh, don't hesitate to identify questions on a card or um, come to the microphone when you want to raise a question. So let's get going without further ado. Uh, the first question, there's been, we've talked already uh, in various sessions at the Regulatory Information Conference about the, re the reactor oversight process. There have been several activities uh, that have been conducted to identify potential changes to the reactor oversight process uh, to continue to improve its efficiency uh, and its effectiveness. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion on potential changes related to the reactor oversight process action matrix threshold um, for, thresh for um, transition from column two to column three to the substantive cross-cutting issues uh, uh, area of our process and to the size and scope or focus of the component design basis inspection or CDBI program. And so I have a question for the NRC panelists. What actions are being taken on these programs? How do the regions view each of the proposed changes summarized above. And I'm going to ask Mark and, and uh, Dan if you'll take those questions first. Uh, and then following that, I'm going to, just to, to warn you guys, uh, our industry colleagues, uh, what safety benefit or detriment do you see from the current processes uh, in these areas, and what changes would you think would be most beneficial to safety, uh, again, as it relates to the reactor oversight process? So Mark, you want to start? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Hopefully folks can hear me okay here. Uh, let me start out with uh, the one aspect there for which I'm sure there's uh, relatively little interest, and that is the uh, substantive uh, cross-cutting issue process here. <laughs> um, by way of background, uh, our, uh, I'll call it the uh, ROP founding fathers back in the 1999-2000 timeframe, uh, incorporated uh, cross-cutting areas uh, into the original uh, reactor oversight process or ROP framework uh, because that group determined uh, that these items generally manifest themselves as the root causes of performance problems. Uh, we, the NRC, further developed the uh, sub current substantive cross-cutting issue process uh, in response to commission direction to the staff to enhance the reactor oversight process treatment of cross-cutting issues to more fully address safety culture. And as many of you uh, should be aware, the intended purpose of assigning a substantive cross-cutting issue is to inform the licensee that the NRC has a concern with the licensee's performance in the cross-cutting area and to encourage the licensee to take appropriate actions before more significant performance issues emerge. We've had various public meetings over the last uh, couple of years where the uh, industry ha has expressed their concern. And their central concern regarding the current substantive cross-cutting issue process is that, uh, you know, challenging the uh, premise that uh, four findings with the same cross-cutting aspect in a 12-month period is indicative of potential performance problems, especially considering that the findings are primarily of very low safety significance. You know, we have green findings for which we would look at a cross-cutting aspect typically. Another concern that was expressed by the industry uh, was the uh, significant resources required to address and disposition the substantive cross-cutting issues for the perceived very low safety benefit. The industry uh, has provided us uh, with an alternative model for oversight of licensee safety culture in lieu of our uh, substantive cross-cutting issue process. Uh, that uh, process, the industry process, uh, which would be voluntary, is described in the Nuclear Energy Institute or NEI guidance document, NEI 0907, entitled uh, Fostering a Healthy uh, Nuclear Safety Culture. Uh, back in uh, February of last year, 
Uh, Brian McDermott led an independent assessment, uh, uh, and that uh, study was provided, uh, it was dated February 18th. And in that uh, study, there was a recommendation that the staff perform a comprehensive analysis to determine whether the use of cross-cutting issues and safety culture provides regulatory value in terms of licensee safety performance for the resources expended. As a result of that recommendation, uh, Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Division of Inspection and Regional Support uh, led a working group uh, that uh, conducted an effectiveness review of our substantive cross-cutting issue process and then developed a number of recommendations. Uh, that working group had uh, three overarching conclusions. Uh, the first uh, conclusion was it is difficult to prove that licensee corrective actions resulting from identification of a substantive cross-cutting issue prevented more significant performance issues, especially for those licensees whose performance was steady before and after an SCCI or substantive cross-cutting issue was identified. Consequently, the staff was unable to determine if the substantive cross-cutting issue process was effective in preventing more significant safety issues. The second overarching conclusion was that substantive cross-cutting issues are not a leading indicator for declining licensee performance. Licensees moved right in the action matrix 86 times without identification of a substantive cross-cutting issue. And then the third conclusion from the working group was the resource cost for implementing the substantive cross-cutting issue process is significant without an apparent commensurate increase in the safety benefit. I should mention that that working group did consist of safety culture experts, uh, staff from uh, NRR, uh, the Office of Enforcement, and each of the regions were represented. Again, the original problem statement was the level of effort to develop, open, and close substantive cross-cutting issues is not commensurate with the perceived value. Stated differently, regulatory actions and outcomes from identifying and monitoring substantive cross-cutting issues do not achieve gains in protecting public health and safety that are commensurate with the resources expended. Based on those conclusions and that problem statement, the, the uh, working group had a number of recommendations. The first recommendation was uh, to um, not endorse uh, the proposed industry process that is uh, uh, captured in uh, NEI 0907. And the various reasons for that were there were concerns with inconsistent implementation of the program. Uh, recent revision to NEI 0907, revision one, which was uh, issued recently, further reduces standardization of the process in providing several different options for licensing implementation. There was some concern that revision one removed the process requirement for an independent safety culture assessment. The working group had some concerns with the lack of transparency for the public with the industry's process. The substantive cross-cutting issue process provides a formal means of communicating an NRC concern with the licensee's performance in a cross-cutting area to the public through a very transparent uh, process in the semi-annual assessment letters. And then there was the recognized assertion that if a licensee is effectively implementing the NEI 07, 0907 safety culture monitoring process, the likelihood the NRC would issue a substantive cross-cutting issue is significantly reduced. Another recommendation was to revise the terminology, eliminate substantive due to negative connotations which may or may not be valid. The implies an issue with higher significance than may be justified by using substantive. Uh, increase the threshold for a cross-cutting theme from four to six findings with the same cross-cutting aspect. Uh, that should reduce some of the resource burden and be more indicative of a trend. Uh, and the thought was a higher threshold could result in, in substantive cross-cutting issues uh, being a better predictor of declining licensee performance. Now, there were a couple uh, additional recommendations regarding uh, creating a backstop of 20 and 12 findings in the cross-cutting area of human performance and problem identification and resolution, respectively. Uh, when you look at the process that was being proposed with the change in the uh, threshold from four to six, uh, theoretically, uh, you could have a, a theme of six findings with the same cross-cutting aspect, whereby you have as many as 70 findings with human performance cross-cutting aspects and not meet the criteria for a cross-cutting theme. Similarly, you could have as many as 30 findings in the area of problem identification and resolution and uh, without reaching the criteria for a theme. And, and the staff felt that these numbers of findings would be indicative of a systemic problem in human performance or with, or with the corrective action program. There was a recommendation that the subjective questions prescribed by Inspection Manual Chapter 0305, which is our operating reactor assessment program, should be eliminated and more objective criteria established for opening 
a substantive cross-cutting issue. The first occurrence of a theme, that would be after a 12-month period, so that would be a minimum of six findings with the same cross-cutting aspect, the recommendation was to document the theme in an assessment letter, consider reviewing licensee causal analysis and corrective actions through a focused problem identification resolution sample. For the second consecutive occurrence, so we're now looking at over a period of 18 months, uh, the, uh, we would document the theme in an assessment letter, review licensee progress in addressing the theme, and conduct a PINR sample if not done earlier. Then for the third consecutive occurrence, and that I'd offer while you're looking at a 12-month rolling uh, uh, period uh, in, in determining whether there are uh, six findings, a minimum of six findings with the same cross-cutting aspect, by the time you get to the third consecutive period, you've had issues there over a 24-month period. Uh, at that point, we would assign a cross-cutting issue. Uh, and then we would develop uh, standard cross-cutting issue closure criteria. Uh, we would recommend a follow-up inspection similar to the 95001 to review licensees' causal analysis and corrective actions. If uh, at the time we issue a, 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 a cross-cutting issue and the following assessment period, which would be six months later, we still had not closed the uh, cross-cutting issue, then we would look at potentially some additional regulatory actions like having the regional administrator and or the executive director for operations meet with the licensee's board of directors, uh, discuss the licensee at the agency action review meeting uh, with the potential uh, for recommending that that licensee uh, meet with the commission. And then if you're a licensee in column four of the uh, action matrix, uh, all cross-cutting issues would be closed out as part of the confirmatory action letter closure process. So those are the various recommendations that were put forward by the working group, and my understanding is that the staff is proceeding to implement those changes, and uh, uh, Scott, you can tell me uh, the time frame for that. I think uh, we're looking in the next, uh, for mid-cycles, for the next mid-cycle assessment period. Uh, but th those are the recommendations, and uh, those are the actions going forward uh, that we decided to uh, implement to address the, the uh, suggestion from the independent assessment that we look at the cross-cutting issue process we currently have in place holistically and determine what changes are appropriate. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to pick up the other two items on, on Mike's list, the action matrix threshold and, and the CDBI. So I'll start with the action matrix threshold. Uh, the issue that was raised here from the independent assessment is, is looking at the entry criteria into column three of the action matrix, which is called the degraded cornerstone. Uh, and, and the current criteria for entering column three is one yellow input or two white inputs in any cornerstone. And the question is focused on the two white inputs piece. Two white inputs are, are inputs that are in the 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus fifth risk band. Uh, as opposed to the yellow would be in the 10 to minus 5th to 10 to minus 4th. And the fundamental question is if you have two uh, white inputs that are low in that 10 to the minus 6th band, uh, they, they don't add up to be equivalent to a, a 10 to the minus 5. And so is it appropriate to have that, that kind of uh, regulatory response to two white inputs? And, and the regulatory response, just for perspective, uh, on a column two, we respond with a 9501 inspection, which is focused at the specific issue that behind, is behind the white input uh, and is in the neighborhood of 40 hours of inspection effort. Uh, if you get into column three in the degraded cornerstone, we're going to do a much more intrusive inspection that's going to look at cross-cutting aspects and get deeper into a licensee's root cause and corrective actions for the issues that got them into column three. Uh, and that inspection effort for the staff can be upwards of several hundred hours uh, of, of inspection effort. Uh, and there's a significant increase corresponding in, in the level of effort that a licensee puts into preparing for that. Uh, so the question was, should we go to three white inputs in one cornerstone as, as a threshold for entering column three? Uh, that was discussed in a public meeting that, that uh, NRR sponsored in January. Uh, the proposal that is being put forward would be to go from two white inputs in a cornerstone to three white inputs in a cornerstone. There would be corresponding adjustments to the 9501 inspection procedure because now you would have the potential for uh, having two white inputs in the regulatory response column, and so we would have uh, adjustments to the sample sizes and the, and the inspection hours under 9501 to reflect uh, multiple uh, white inputs uh, in that, in that uh, performance area. Um, so 
there's uh, there was a basis that, that the staff put forward in the discussion for that uh, looked at uh, the their in, in the history of the ROP, there have been 75 plants that have entered into column three. 31 of those plants have entered into column three based on two white inputs. Uh, so the staff focused in on those. Uh, there are some of those that entries into column three that were in cornerstones that don't have quantified uh, significance determination process. And so, uh, so they don't provide a lot of insight from the risk perspective. Uh, so, so the staff has, has developed uh, the the uh, the discussion on on uh, what what is the really the significance of two white inputs. Uh, they also look back at the original discussions in the establishment of the ROP. Uh, there was input from our our senior risk analysts at that time that suggested that that five white inputs maybe uh, correspond to a yellow. Uh, the uh, the decision at the time was two white inputs. Uh, it was recognized to be a, a conservative decision. The, the staff revisited that decision uh, and brought it to the commission in 2003. And at that time, the commission agreed to, to keep it at two white inputs. Uh, we're looking at that again with a lot more history and, and, and uh, data to look at. So the, the, the NRR plans to put together a, a commission paper on this issue. It, it is uh, threshold of the action matrix is fundamentally a, a policy issue in the, the structure of the reactor oversight process. So the expectation is by the end of April we'll see a commission paper that will go to the commission uh, and let them decide on the issue. There are uh, a number of, of uh, diverse views within the staff, within the working group that was put together on this issue. Uh, those will be reflected, we expect, in the commission paper by presenting different options to the commission and discussion of the pros and cons for those options. Uh, moving on to the CDBI question. Of the three topics, this is the one that, that is perhaps the, the least developed uh, in, in terms of where the staff will go on this issue, uh, but it, it has been an issue that's been under discussion for some time. The component design basis inspections is a portion of the baseline inspection program under the reactor oversight process that uh, in which the, the inspectors will go into a licensee's design basis documents and drill down for a particular system uh, to look at, at the, what the basis was for the design and maintenance of the, that system and how effectively the licensee is maintaining that design basis in their ongoing operations and maintenance of the system. And uh, over time, the results of those inspections uh, have, uh, th I think early on there were more greater than green findings. Recently there, there have been more green findings out of these inspections and so the question is being raised uh, appropriately in the context of our ongoing assessment of the baseline inspection process of are we focusing uh, our resources in, in the m best areas for, for safety. Uh, and a white paper has been provided to the staff uh, from the industry making some suggestions on ways to improve the, the, this inspection area. Uh, we did have a, a public meeting in, in January to discuss this area. I think a couple of key points out of that meeting. Uh, from the NRC's perspective, this inspection is one of the most important inspections in the baseline inspection program. Uh, most of the, the uh, operations and maintenance related inspection areas are, are, are focused on the, the, uh, the current operability of systems and the effective operation of systems and maintenance of the systems. This is the one that really drills down to is the licensee maintaining the plant uh, as it was licensed to be built and operated. Um, also from our experience, uh, this is not something that you do on, for uh, one inspector for a week to, to do an effective job in this type of inspection. And so for us, the, the team structure is key to the success of, of these inspections. Uh, we note that, that we also had some input from public stakeholders that, that they viewed this as one of the most important inspections that we do. But we also have uh, feedback from the industry that, that based on their performance in this area that it no longer warrants an inspection of the scope and impact of the current inspection. Uh, they note that they do a significant amount of effort to prepare for these inspections and they wonder if there's a way that we can give credit for that self-assessment process uh, being effectively conducted as part of the inspection activity and, and to enable us to kind of scale that back. 
So the bottom line is, is where we are, we're fairly, fairly early in the process in looking at the component design basis inspection. Uh, there is a diversity of views both within the staff and with uh, outside stakeholders. Uh, and so there will be a continued dialogue on this one as, as we work forward to, a, to a, uh, recommendations. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Dan, for those answers. Um, Joe, let me just turn to you for, uh, for an industry perspective. Um, again, what's the safety benefit or detriment uh, that you see in the current processes, and uh, what changes would you see as being most beneficial? Uh, sure. Thanks, Mike, and good morning. Uh, overall, we support the ROP as a very good tool to determine how to respond to licensee performance. And I'll start in this area with the action matrix. You know, the potential move to raise the presentation or the um, Transition threshold to column three to three white inputs is a positive move in our opinion and should alleviate some of the pressure that occurs when we over respond early in the SDP phase. And I think most importantly, it aligns us better to respond truly to the safety significance of each of the individual issues. This should also be a positive effect on column four potentially, which is a very large concern to the industry, obviously, because of the cost for entry and the extremely significant activities to recover. So overall, you know, a step in the right direction and would give both the NRC and the licensees room to focus more on fixing the actual problems and debating the risk significance up front. Let me talk a little bit about cross-cutting issues. You know, we welcome the changes as a first step. Most of the utilities have established, you know, response thresholds and actions in this area that include performance analysis that understands common linkage of the issues. And then in addition, there's also many other sources of data, the corrective action process, which is well used, well understood, and well talked about, the safety culture monitoring program, and others that the utilities all rely on for uh, plant performance, which provides very clear insights into trends and, and the necessary response actions to both anticipate and then to arrest any declines that could occur in performance. So given that, we would encourage the NRC to continue to assess the changes you're talking about and the cross-cutting thresholds, and again, maybe in two years to come back and look at the impact of this first step revision that you're considering versus key plant processes and how well they overlap. And then lastly, CDBI, you know, we recognize very much the importance of this inspection, as Dan said. The industry recognizes that safe operation depends on the maintenance of the integrity of the plant design and the fidelity to it. The inspection in its current format has become a significant burden to the station operations, the site engineering resources, and over time is yielding less in the area of significance and safety uh, significance at all. So we believe this should be f shifted in focus from design verification, more so to a validation of the programs that maintain the health of the design basis, especially for those risk significant systems and components, and in using the self-assessment processes that the industry has. Overall, we think this will allow for reducing the scope. We believe it will also impact the duration and especially the team size and just overall impact for the inspections. Okay, very good. Thank you, Joe. Randy, anything to add? You don't have to, but you're welcome. <laughs> It'll be hard no, to contain. I'll, I'll, I'll let Joe handle that. Okay, all right, very good. This next question really relates to regional differences. And I'm going to start off with, uh, actually, I'm going to address the industry panel first. Here's the question. Um, in September 2013, the Government Accountability Office issued a report that identified differences in the number of green findings and non-escalated violations in the regions since inception of the reactor oversight process. And so my question is, what's your perspective regarding uh, the consistency with, with which the, in, the regions conduct the ROP activities? And is this a significant problem from your perspective? Randy, do you want to take that one? Yes, I'll take that. Uh, you know, having a, a strong and independent uh, regulator is something that we feel is important to everyone. Uh, we have an industry that's matured uh, dramatically, and we're, we're used to comparing information across the various venues, whether it's MPO or metrics. And from that, we get very strong uh, uh, views uh, of our performance. So we do think it's important to have consistency. We're not looking for 
just an absolute carbon, but we think uh, evaluating those differences adds a strength and credibility to the regulatory process. Uh, you can find sometimes an area that maybe is being driven by one area, and we don't think that is uh, good for, good, for uh, good regulation overall. So we, we do believe that a, a regular comparison between the regions and, and seeking reasonable consistency would be very important to uh, continue in the effort for credible uh, regulations. Uh, we also think, again, there's opportunities as we compare those, uh, those areas to look for areas to strengthen. Again, either an, an issue that's identified that, that needs to be broadened or in other cases where one is being unfairly uh, pushed on in one region. So those are, uh, we do think that's uh, important. We think it's uh, capable, very capable right now. And again, we're looking for a strong, independent, and credible regulator just like you are. All right, very good. Thank you, Randy. So now let me turn to, uh, to the NRC. Um, your question related to this topic is, how do you view the GAO report? And what have the regions done about it? And I'm gonna ask Vic to start. But before Vic does, I, I can't resist this. I got to ask you, does Vic have on a white shirt with gold tie, <laughs> or how many people see black and blue? <laughs> Should I give the answer? <laughs> Go ahead, Vic, please. It's, it's, it's actually brown and gold. No, it's, it's, it's blue and gold. You know, this, this is an interesting question. It, it, it's one that we've um, addressed before. I think this is the seventh opportunity I've had to uh, participate in this particular regional session. And in, invariably, the question of regional differences arise. So it's clear, it's apparent that we've not uh, addressed it in a sufficient manner. Um, and there's also some differences here, optical differences. You'll note, if you're looking, that the regional administrators are on one side of the dais and the uh, industry is on the other. Uh, so we are, uh, our, which symbolizes our uh, principle of good regu regulation of independence, so we're separate. <laughs> but in independence doesn't mean isolation, uh, and definitely on this particular subject. As, as background, uh, about 18 months ago, uh, the uh, Government Accountability Office uh, issued a report uh, based on an audit it had done on our implementation of our reactor oversight process and how we identify issues, how we evaluate them for significance, and how we resolve them. And that report included a number of observations, findings, uh, one of which was noteworthy is that, um, that uh, in comparison among the regions, uh, we identify uh, about the same number of, quote, safety significant uh, findings and, and violations. Uh, but of lower significance findings, green uh, non-cited violations, um, uh, green findings in you know, lower risk, less severe violations, there was uh, significant differences uh, among the regions. Uh, they noted that this was previously known, longstanding. In fact, the audit covered a 13-year period from 2010 to 2012, uh, although in fact the, the differences actually preceded uh, the REACT oversight process. Uh, uh, and w although there were several initiatives that we had taken over the years, uh, it was concluded that those differences weren't that significant uh, because, again, in uh, most cases, licensees would enter those issues into their uh, corrective action programs and uh, be available for the regions to uh, sample the effective implementation of corrective actions. But the report concluded uh, accurately that we had not uh, conducted a comprehensive analysis of, of the differences and that our, quote, oversight efforts um, uh, are to confirm that they're objective and consistent and know whether uh, the regional offices or inspectors are applying our regulations and guidance consistently. So we took that to heart and NR led an effort um, uh, over the last uh, year to conduct a tabletop review which included uh, about 56 uh, folks, um, about 53 from the regions, both inspectors and uh, and supervisors and others from NOR, and they conducted, uh, participated in a survey where scenario-specific questions were asked and answered and non-scenario-specific questions to get folks' views on, uh, on, on how performance issues are identified, uh, what the threshold should be in terms of minor and more, more than minor, uh, how they would credit uh, identification, uh, because in our process we would uh, grant 
uh, credit for licensees if a licensee identifies the issue or if it's self-identified or, of course, if it's NRC identified. Uh, that has merit in our process in terms of whether and how uh, an issue is documented. And the responses to those questions were uh, evaluated and there were, there were two noteworthy um, uh, themes that came uh, out, of the re out of the review. One is that uh, there's differences in how we implement um, uh, the more than minor screening, uh, using the more than minor screening questions in our guidance. And secondly, how we uh, assign identification uh, credit, again, as licensee or identified or, or self-revealing. And those results generally, generally align uh, with the results of the uh, of the GAO survey. So we use that as input to, uh, to base our follow-on actions, which, which are ongoing. But I'd like to ask Cindy if she would go into a little bit more detail on those. Thanks, Vic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the working group that looked at these various things did take a lot of input from um, various inspectors and branch chiefs throughout the agency. So the next step was to take that and try to align on where we wanted to move forward in these areas of noted difference. And so the regional uh, senior leaderships got together and did the same um, evolution of going through these scenarios to come up with ways in which we could align uh, so the agency would move forward. And just give you a couple of examples where the division directors working with NRR and the regions identified some differences. Uh, one was in the area of calculational errors and a noted difference was in how much of a change or how much of a revision was necessary for um, an inspector to call that more than minor. So that was an example where differences in the threshold were being used. Another one that was noted was the self-identification or self-revealing, particularly in the area of surveillances. There were noted differences in how the regions chose to implement that. Another area was in the area of equipment deficiencies. Even though it may be able to provide its function, margin was lost. So how much margin is too much margin to cross the threshold? And another one of the noted differences was in answering the question of if left uncorrected, would the uh, issue become a more significant issue? So those are some examples of areas we identified for need for further work. Now all the regions have agreed that we do need to make changes to clarify our guidance such that we have more reliable outcomes for those types of areas. So what will happen is uh, another working group will be put together to work out those particulars in the guidance documents. And then those guidance documents will also be shared publicly as part of our normal process for making changes to our inspection program. So that's an opportunity for members of the public and for industry to provide feedback on that. I'll just note that even though there'll be some changes, uh, it's not to say one way was right or one way was wrong in the past. We identified some, um, if you will, ability to, to implement the guidance differently, and so the need here is to tighten up that guidance such that for a similar set of facts, a similar outcome comes forward. In addition, uh, Bill Dean and his staff in NRR have identified a desire to look a little bit more programmatically at our implementation of the inspection program. We do that in other areas already, in operator licensing, for example, our materials programs and others. Um, but the ROP oversight process, we're going to look at, we in the regions and with working with Bill and his group, to come up with a way that we can have a little more ongoing uh, ROP oversight. Thanks, Vic. Thank, go ahead, Vic, please. The one other area that Cindy and I failed to mention is, is training. Uh, one of the important um, uh, discoveries, if you would, from the uh, review that was done is that of the two main factors driving uh, the differences, uh, one was uh, the guidance and, and different interpretations of the guidance. The second one was, was training. Uh, and that one's a bit uh, thorny, if you would, because the regions do implement training. Uh, some of it's on-the-job training and how we train people to implement the guidance or use, uh, um, again, use the guidance. And what was noted was that there was difference in uh, the training that the different regions were, were giving. Uh, so one of the areas we're going to look at is, is 
providing uh, better sharing of that of that training and perhaps using NR as a resource to make sure that we're uh, training and developing our inspectors and our, our supervisors to implement the guidance, the improved guidance, uh, more cons more uh, with fewer differences, more more reliably. All right, very good. And just staying with that topic, and I think Cindy, maybe you were touching on this a little bit. A question from the floor: Are initial license exams being reviewed as part of the comparison between the regions to verify consistency and exam difficulty? There's actually a, a, another effort going on in the area of operator licensing. Um, operator licensing has a routine basis uh, been overseen by NRR on a, a uh, every four-year basis, if I remember right, and I think in our off years, we do our own self-assessments in the regions. Uh, but there was a, a notable um, licensing reversal that came out through the court system, and after that, a uh, working group on the agency's part was put together to examine the lessons learned from that. And so that is an area, it's uh, separate from this particular uh, reliability effort looking at the findings, but we do have a parallel path that is looking at um, a number of enhancements to be done in the operator licensing area. There are some that were taken very soon after uh, the court decision was made, but we have more that we're looking at, so that's yet to come. Okay, very good. Question for the industry. Please describe any challenges associated with vendors supporting vintage INC equipment. Please describe any challenges associated with vendors supporting vintage INC equipment. Uh, I'll start. I'll start, Mike. I, I think that um, most of the vendors are uh, very engaged in working on this issue. You know, obsolescence is a challenge for the industry as well as the vendors. Uh, for the most part, I see a lot of engagement on that. I think there's some areas where um, some of the specific instrumentation is hard to get and, you know, you're really looking at doing an upgrade or a modification. I think the industry's gotten better at doing those over the years. Um, certainly, at times, it leads into a challenge. Can you move into digital space on some of these or not? And how easy is that? And what are the challenges that that brings? Yeah, I would also say uh, obviously with obsolescence, uh, vendors have also had dramatic turnover just like all of the uh, uh, industries and the NRC, uh, and, and supporting our existing systems are extremely important. Uh, it will be necessary to make controlled changes in the digital, and of course this is an area that itself takes a, a lot of very specific, but uh, I would just emphasize at this time that uh, this is a challenging area as we work through the obsolescence uh, that we'll need to continue to support uh, each other as we work through those areas, uh, working with the vendors, and then eventually the upgrades that will be necessary as we go forward. Very good. Thank you. So I'm going to stay with the topic of uh, digital um, technology um, for a few minutes. And I've got a question that I'd like to pose to the panel, and it is, the industry is faced with opportunities and challenges associated with moving forward with equipment upgrades uh, for digital components. What's your perspective on ways the industry and the NRC can work together to improve our overall effectiveness and efficiency in our respective uh, roles? And sort of as a related question to that, uh, a question from the floor, given that all equipment degrades and wears with time, please describe any age-related issues with instrumentation and control equipment. So, um, so the topic is instrumentation and control. How do we, uh, how, do, how can we work uh, in, in a way that is, uh, that is more um, conducive to progress, industry, NRC, uh, and then any particular challenges associated with instrumentation and control, digital? So, Mike, I, I think there, can you hear me okay? Hello? Yeah. Ah, good. So, Mike, I, I, think, I think there have been some pockets of success in the area of uh, use of digital uh, INC technology, even in some safety applications and uh, guidance has been developed um, and we've endorsed uh, some industry guidance, NEI 101 specifically, that have supported some of the uh, digital modifications and upgrades that have been made, uh, but I think there's still significant room to improve. Um, and in that regard, I think those improvements will be most successful and most timely if we keep the communications open. Uh, there continue to be um, 
uh, good, healthy communication among the industry counterparts, NEI, and I know EPRI has a role there, uh, as well as uh, uh, NRR. Um, I do understand that uh, NEI and EPRI have recently formed a, a working group, group to look at a significant modification to uh, NEI 101, if not a, a replacement uh, to it, uh, to address some of the challenges that, uh, uh, that exist in that document. And that document uh, provides guidance, again, that we've endorsed uh, to enable uh, digital modifications under uh, 10 CFR 5059. Um, and that EPRI is actually uh, embarked on a, a technical review, if you would, to, uh, uh, to address the common cause failure um, concerns that, uh, that exist in a number of the uh, potential upgrades. Um, also, there's opportunity to um, upgrade the guidance for 5059 modifications, the NEI 0607, I believe, uh, to support uh, the licensing reviews. Um, so, again, there's a lot of work ongoing. We, as an agency need to remain engaged with the industry uh, to make sure that uh, uh, anyone who chooses to take advantage of those uh, digital upgrades do it uh, very thoughtfully and, and with a shared understanding of, of what the uh, requirements are. And in that regard, uh, this is an area, and there are a number, where pre-application uh, meetings with the NRR staff are extraordinarily important. Uh, so there's a shared understanding of uh, processes and contents of the application and the expectations, uh, or shared expectations uh, between the licensee and, and NRR. Um, I also understand from an NRC perspective that there's a, a pilot uh, use of uh, interim staff guidance six uh, regarding licensing reviews that, uh, again, it's being piloted, should be completed, completed sometime this year, uh, and there will be an opportunity or will certainly create opportunities to engage the industry on that uh, interim staff guidance uh, number six. Um, and let me just, let me just stop there. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Vic. Joe, do you want to? Uh, yeah, if I could just come in. I mean, I think there's, I think we both face the same issues in this area. You know, digital evolves quickly, and, and the knowledge base to keep up with it is a challenge, I think, for both the regulator and for us. And, and I really think that, um, as Vic said, I think continuing to keep the dialogue going is very important. The working group, I think, will, will uh, you know, bring some new issues to light and try to readdress some of the, the uh, approaches that were originally out there. I think, you know, there's generic regulatory concerns with some of the specific digital technologies that we need to make sure we're dialoguing on, um, getting clarity of, on the places that there may be gaps in some of the regulatory guidance, and really just making sure that we develop more generic information that, you know, is very supportive of growing regulatory confidence and giving us confidence on the industry side that we can keep moving forward. Very good. This next question is really uh, directed at the regional administrators, although I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up. I'd like everybody to have a chance to answer this. It, and the question is, are there themes, uh, and it, it relates to an activity that we've just completed in terms of looking at the performance of plants and, and as a part of our annual roll-up, are there any themes or low-level issues that are concerning you for your respective regions? And I would ask the industry folks, are there, are there themes or low-level issues from your perspective uh, that we ought to be mindful of? And so um, I guess I'll start with the NRC, and then, but I'll ask the industry to weigh in as well. Mike, maybe I could start that discussion off. Um, one of the areas that we've been noting in our end of cycle and, and mid-cycle before that is weaknesses in operability determinations. We've seen um, quite a number of uh, sites that have not um, done very well in that area that we've had findings and, and a number of issues. So we are, are partnering um, with the other regions as well as with industry to put on an operability workshop. And I'm going to look for a call out May 12th. May 12th, thank you. Um, a location in the Chicago area. And that's going to be an op opportunity for the agency, um, the regions and, and NRR, to engage with um, utilities and members of the public on operability determinations and evaluations. So that's an area that we've identified and we've seen as a trend, and that's what we're doing in response to it. Similarly, similarly to what uh, Cindy said, uh, we've seen some challenges with the uh, quality of operability determinations, but uh, 
as a result of the most recently completed end of cycle assessment uh, uh, last month, uh, one of the things that uh, we noted uh, was some real challenges with the uh, quality of uh, the operator uh, licensing examinations. Uh, there have been a number of licensees in Region uh, 4 where there have been uh, significant turnover of staff and you have some uh, relatively inexperienced folks that are involved in preparing the exam and uh, it's resulted in a fair amount of uh, uh, resource expenditure uh, by the region in uh, working with the licensees to uh, develop the exam uh, to address the deficiencies and in some instances uh, rejecting the exam uh, and I know there are a workshop coming up and there's going to be some discussion about uh, uh, exam questions and, and how to address uh, the gap uh, in terms of uh, difficulty of exams so hopefully that will be productive but that's an area where uh, I noted in sitting in to each of the end of cycle discussions uh, I thought was a trend uh, that I didn't recall from some of the previous uh, assessment discussions. So I'll, uh, I'll echo uh, the lower and the question was lower level uh, issues or trends and I would uh, echo that as well. Uh, we've also seen a couple of examples of uh, uh, turbine building concrete degradation. Uh, just a couple of examples of that um, uh, where there were water intrusion issues, clogged drains um, uh, in a turbine building. So we're trying to better understand what that is and if there's any uh, generic insights that could be drawn from that that may be of value. Um, and uh, there are se uh, several examples of uh, maintenance, inadequate maintenance rule implementation. Uh, again, not a significant trend, but lower level issues where we've given uh, feedback on. Uh, in fact, some of them may have even been minor violations, but uh, it wouldn't have gotten in a report, but uh, at least in Region 2. Uh, but uh, fortunately, um, <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, it was an opportunity to give uh, feedback to the licensee who was very receptive to it. Uh, I, I do appreciate the, the, the question, uh, lower level issues, uh, and the fact the, the question is asked means that you value that feedback uh, and would take action to address those issues before they become a regulatory concern. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Just uh, I would second the comment on the, the rigor of operability determinations and expand it to include corrective action program issues uh, in, in um, rigor in the, in the root cause evaluations and development of corrective action plans. Um, it, the other thing I would put out there is, is uh, broadly equipment reliability. I, I think licensees are doing a good job in maintaining the equipment that is the greatest risk contributors, um, but then the, the other equipment that is uh, supporting uh, the, that equipment and supporting the operators in response to events. Uh, sometimes we don't see the same rigor in, in that equipment and we see that coming up as, as challenges to operators when something happens to the plant. Uh, one or two other things happen and, and complicate the operator's response to the events. Uh, so again, it's not, it's not the, the diesels and the hipsies and the rixies, it's, it's more the, the, the supporting equipment, uh, but it just complicates life for the operators unnecessarily. Okay. Randy, Joe? Uh, I just comment in the equipment area. I, I really think, you know, ensuring that corrective actions really stick. I mean, most issues we all know previously occurred somewhere in the industry. In many cases, we've solved them ourselves, and then they come back, you know, at different times. And I just think we need to continue to make sure that um, those issues as they reoccur that are really getting the appropriate attention in the corrective action process. Yeah, I would uh, it might go a slightly different, we're talking about themes in our area. We have lots and lots of new people in all our industry, uh, yet we have an industry that has everywhere from pre-general design criteria plants to general design criteria to new plants. Uh, so the, the, the kind of the redefining of regulations, you know, as we're going along, we, we think we have this, we have new people, and the next thing we know, well, that's not what it meant. So that's a theme that I would, uh, that I'm concerned about. I know a lot of people out here are that you know what the rules continue to be challenged. Which again, I kind of go back to the the uh, question you had where we should be comparing note across region because it may start here, and, and there's a chance for us to look at those and say, wait a second, let's do a reset. But you know the reality is we do have our licenses from pre-GDC to GDC early and late to new. And, and, 
a challenge, especially as we bring in new people, of uh, ensuring that we maintain our license of basis and do upgrades where necessary, but be careful that we're not redefining things uh, without going through a due process. Thank you. Good answers, uh, everyone. And I, Randy, you uh, started me on a, a topic I was going to go to um, uh, maybe a little bit later, but I'll, you took me there, so we'll go there now. Uh, and it relates to the workforce in the industry and the fact that that workforce, uh, I talk about industry broadly, uh, is aging um, and retirements are increasing. And so the question is what actions are being taken uh, by licensees in the NRC to retain knowledge in important areas um, like the one that you just described, Brandy, uh, to retain knowledge of experienced workers, uh, NRC staff, so on and so forth. So um, let me, Randy, ask you if you want to continue with an answer on that topic, and then I'll shift over and get it, NRC. Uh, well, I can uh, open it up. It's an area that I'm quite interested in. Uh, you know, first off, I want to say that the, the young people that we're bringing in, the capabilities uh, is, is just fantastic. Uh, but an aggressive, in, in my particular case, if I hire 150 people this year, I can still go down 30 people uh, because of the turnover that we're dealing with. Uh, so it is extremely important to uh, do knowledge transfer, and we frequently think of the knowledge transfer from operators and all, but I'll go back to kind of the theme I started, the regulatory knowledge, the regulatory transfer. Uh, in many cases, we're not as formal on ensuring that that history is fully understood and the rules and the licenses. Uh, so I, I do think that's an area that could use that not only at the, uh, well, certainly at the utilities, but again, I would ask what the regulator is doing to ensure that the plants that are pre-GDC, which are many of them, or early GDC plants are are uh, getting a fair shake as, as they go through that type of area. Okay, um, Cindy, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, we too have the similar problem. And actually, I asked for a couple of statistics thinking this topic might come up. And today in the NRC, 19% of our workforce is currently eligible to retire. And in five years, that number climbs to 62%. Now, not everybody retires upon their eligibility, but you know, those numbers are rather shocking. Um, so it's certainly something that is on our minds. And we're doing a number of things. Certainly one of them is, is hiring the right people and getting um, experienced people and people that we need to develop um, into our pipeline. And so we're doing that um, in a mindful way. You heard a lot during this about AIM 2020 and how we're anticipating the agency may um, get smaller, but that's not um, going to have us stop hiring the right kind of people because we are going to continue to have the need. So we're looking to do things like what we call double encumbering. If we know people are going to leave, we need to uh, want to bring them in such that we can have that turnover in a meaningful way with those experienced people that are leaving. And we're also doing what we call over hiring. If we don't know a specific person that may be going, we know an area that we're going to need. And so we're bringing people in while we have the talent still before they retire to start sharing that knowledge. We're doing a number of other things. Um, there are a number of things that, for example, the Office of Research is doing, is putting on seminar seminars, and those are being recorded. Some of them are being developed into new regs for more broad distribution, as an example. I know all the regions and offices are also having we call them knowledge management uh, sessions or knowledge transfer sessions where we're bringing um, various topics and spreading that knowledge throughout our organization. Uh, again, trying to capture those things when we can. Though honestly, we're struggling a little bit about how you capture the, some of that knowledge such that it's retrievable uh, from people. So, um, you know, if, if people have good ideas to share about how to capture that in a retrievable way uh, for years to come, that's something that we certainly could learn from. And those are just a couple of things that we're doing so far. Anyone else want to weigh in on that topic? Again, you're not constrained to or compelled to. All right, very good. So I have a couple of questions, really, that are follow-ups to uh, other questions or answers given. One relates to uh, with respect to uh, uh, component design basis inspections. Um, and this really, I think Dan directed at you and, and Joe, but anyone can weigh in as well. Um, what, one, uh, w what are your views about what activities or areas um, should be focused on to get the most bang for the buck as it relates to CDBI uh, inspections? 
Dan, you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, Joe, Joe suggested earlier uh, industry suggestion of, of looking at some programmatic areas that support the design basis. I, th I think there's uh, there's kind of an underlying principle when we went to the ROP that we were moving away from uh, programmatic type inspections and looking for more performance based inspections. Um, so you know we'll, we'll we'll explore that option and 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 uh, but I, I think. The, the going in point from some of the folks who've been around the ROP and remember before ROP is is, is uh, um, reluctant to go in that direction. I think the the there are other elements of the reactor oversight process that relate to the implementation of changes to the plant, uh, the mod design modifications uh, that are areas where you can look at uh, how effectively the licensee is examining the existing licensing basis and design basis in evaluating the change to the, the, to the plant. 50-59 uh, evaluations, uh, the implementation of design modifications. Um, those those can look at how effectively uh, the licensee is, is maintaining their design and licensing basis as they're looking at changes to the plant. I think what the CDBI gives us, though, is, is, is that, that I wouldn't want to lose is, is sort of the insidious changes to the plant, the unintentional de-evolution, if you will, of the design basis. So how, how we, how we, it may be a shift in how we uh, address the balance between those two components. Okay. Yeah, I would just uh, just a couple comments. Uh, you know, I think Insidious is is the good focus, Dan. I mean, a latent designers is the is the place you really I think can provide a lot of benefit as you're looking at that. I also think that um, you know just considering some some sort of performance based approach, you know, that's really based on the known assessment of utility performance over time in this area would give you a pretty good feel for it. I think you, you have a good understanding of where many of the utilities are now. I think you could focus the teams much more effectively if you took that into account. And Mike? Yes, go ahead, Mark, please. Just uh, one comment to uh, add. Uh, having looked at the uh, uh, NEI uh, white paper, uh, one of the things that uh, I noted in particular was uh, uh, the suggestion uh, that uh, we modify the CDBI uh, scope to focus more on validation of the health of uh, various station programs uh, that, if not effectively implemented, uh, could uh, adversely affect design margins, example being modification process, uh, versus uh, the current uh, focus uh, of CDBIs, which is more in the area of design verification. And, and I think we need to maintain uh, the appropriate balance there. I, I would not be a proponent of shifting strictly to uh, assessing the health of licensee programs that could have an impact on the design basis. I think there is value in going back and, and looking at the design verification uh, aspect. And I know there's an issue that we're looking at with the current CDBI where we have a question on uh, the acceptance criteria, and it goes back to the original uh, design assumptions. And so I think there is value in continuing to keep that aspect uh, of the uh, CDBI. Uh, uh, and, and I would offer there probably is room for some scope reduction in that area, but I certainly wouldn't want to lose that element uh, and focus more just strictly on uh, verification of the health of uh, licensee programs that could impact the design basis. Just really quickly, Mike, I, I, I agree with uh, Mark. Uh, I also um, uh, open to uh, the comments that Joe has made. And this is an area of our oversight where over the years uh, we've grown, uh, it's, it's matured. Uh, in fact, when I first started with the NRC a long, long time ago, uh, Mike and I were in the same division, um, and my su first supervisor was Jim Dyer. The first inspection I was on was an engineering inspection. Engineering, uh, we called them back then safety system functional inspections. And when we transitioned to the react oversight process some 15 odd years ago, we changed the name to safety system design and performance capability inspection with a slightly different focus. And not long after that, I think four or five years, we actually piloted the uh, comp component design basis inspection approach in region two, and it was uh, expanded uh, nationwide. I think that that story 
tells me that we're open and interested to feedback and we want to improve this important area of our oversight process. It is truly fundamental, uh, in my opinion, to, uh, to, to safety. And I, 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 think, I hope we're mature enough in our understanding of our process and significance to know that simply because every inspection does not identify a white finding or yellow finding does not mean that it is not adding value. And green is not necessarily good. Minor, perhaps, should be green. But, but, but there are opportunities to learn and grow, and we need to take advantage of the performance improvement, but still uh, modify our program as appropriate to still derive the value from it. So we're, we're committed to do that. It's consistent with our, our principles of efficiency, uh, and, and that's what we'll do. And we'll certainly provide opportunity to engage the industry. Randy, please. Yeah, in this area, so I, I've been a lot of good discussion on it. I, I think a few things that came out, though, is what is the appropriate scope adjustment to get better use of our resources? Uh, how do we take some credit for what the licensees work is going on, uh, which there's quite a bit of that, and, that, and that's an effective use. And then I, I throw in the, the last piece of trying to be real careful not to uh, redefine our design as we're going through these and that we have accepted designs and license places. And again, that creep it, it gets to be uh, something we should watch out for. Okay. Very good. Uh, switching gears a little bit now, we're going to talk about uh, new plant construction. So Joe and Vic, you guys should listen to the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, are there any lessons learned from new plant construction or licensing and execution that have informed or benefited the operating fleet, either in technical issue, closure, or in safety and sites? So things that you've learned, gleaned from uh, new reactor construction and execution that have informed, could inform us, technical issues uh, or otherwise. Do you want to start, Vic, or Joe? <laughs> so we're, we're still learning, um, and I'm sure uh, once um, uh, Watts Bar Unit 2 is, is completed and when the AP1000s are completed, we'll uh, update the uh, guidance documents on lessons learned from the next wave of, of nu nuclear construction in, in the U.S. I think among the lessons that will be spoken to. I don't know if Glenn Tracy is in the audience. One of the uh, challenges uh, that we're seeing uh, is, the, is the quality of um, uh, components in the, in the nuclear supply chain, uh, supplier quality. And uh, that's, that's an issue uh, that I think has uh, relevance uh, in with the operating fleet as well in efforts to assure uh, the right quality, the right uh, pedigree of uh, equipment that even operating uh, facilities uh, need. Uh, and also, uh, I think another area is um, uh, oversight of uh, contractors or oversight of, of work. Um, and that's been manifest uh, not only um, uh, at some of Joe's uh, sites, but other sites I know in, in Region 2 have had lessons learned in terms of the amount of effort and uh, ownership and oversight that you have to give to assure that uh, uh, quality work is conducted on site. So those are just two thoughts. Joe? Uh, yeah, just a couple comments. Mike, I, uh, I think we've taken very good advantage of past industry experience even though in some cases it's been a while, certainly a lot of work that's gone on in the modification process and others have really enabled us to update a lot of the parts of the plant in a fairly efficient way and probably uh, better documented than we, we did in previous times building plants. Uh, you know, interesting enough, I think we've also had a chance to deal head on with some longstanding industry issues with facing a new license in front of us and um, in some cases been able to engage uh, a different technical approaches and I think a deeper dialogue that's enabled both sides to see issues um, from a different perspective. And I think there's some advantage in, in that that will flow back to the operating fleet. And if I could have asked or also introduced a design finality and constructability without going into a whole lot of detail, I think those are important areas as well. 
Go ahead, Dan, just, please. Uh, I think part of the question was benefits to the operating fleet, and I'd just pick up the, the theme that Vic touched on in terms of oversight of contractors, and, and it, it, I think there have been other issues in the operating fleet that go to uh, not just oversight of contractors on site for the operating fleet, that's especially during the outages, but also oversight of contractor services and safety analysis in the procurement chain of, of quality of, uh, of equipment. So I, I think there's, there's a, a broader issue there that, that is uh, something that the operating fleet needs to stay on top of as well. Thank you very much. I've got a couple questions related to uh, cross-cutting issues, and I, you saw me, I'm trying to get this card back from Randy. <laughs> you know whether he was holding on to it because he didn't want me to ask it. <laughs> Just kidding, Randy. Um, but Joe, you've got one also, uh, cross-cutting issues. Uh, the question for you, Randy, and really they're similar questions. What's the most significant cross-cutting issue identified in open at Palo Verde? Uh, what corrective action? I think, the, I think the, 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 really the theme of the thrust of the questions are, uh, as you think about cross-cutting issues, um, at, at the sites, uh, can you talk about one of those, or, or and then, um, you know, how they've how they've really affected you, what you've able, been able to do with those cross-cutting issues as you move forward in terms of corrective actions. So, uh, as I read that, it was talking about the most significant cross-cutting issue. And interesting enough, I'm sitting there trying to work through my head of what is the most significant one. Uh, yeah, we, we do the monthly reviews like many sites where we're looking at all the cross-cutting issues. We do the reviews uh, constantly and then so every area gets tackled. I, I would probably say the, the biggest theme we've been dealing with a little bit is some of our human performance errors. Uh, you know, you look at them at, at surface level and then you start looking deeper. It was really a lot of, again, so much turnover and the real depth of understanding of the why. So the training it was showing up as a human performance error, but it was really more of a training issue and that we we were teaching a lot of the hows and whats and, and not as in-depth of the whys. And doesn't hit you until you have enough new people that that aggregate amount. So if I put two new people on crew, that's it with a lot of experience, but currently we have lots of new people on crew and that experience factor is down. And the training is great, and the procedures are great, and the simulators are great, but the really depth of understanding can manifest itself as a human performance error. And if you're not careful, you go fix the symptom instead of the root cause. And the root cause is not easy because you've got to really go back and teach a real strong depth of understanding because you're now trying to make up for years of experience on a crew. And again, the people that we deal with is just fantastic that you know, if you ever get down in your energy, just go visit one of your classes that you have now. And of course, most of them weren't born when TMI happened, right. so uh, it uh, makes for an interesting discussion on the whys and the depth of understanding. Very good. Thank you. Jeff? Well, I'll just add on that Randy's a little bit. Um, you know, human performance is one of those things that just takes constant steady pressure to stay in front of it, and it's always out there for all of us. But, you know, the one that really gets your attention is if you get something in the safety culture area. And, you know, we all know we're always trying to prevent that. Um, I think you get tremendous amount of learnings about your organization and, you know, what, what you haven't been paying attention to and where the leadership really needs to focus. And probably most importantly, you know, why wasn't the leadership focused in the right places? And so, you know, out of that, I think you can not only um, address the specific issue, but you can really get after a number of other issues that are impacting your performance across the board. And, and so I, I encourage folks to not go there to find out that answer, um, but, it, but it definitely gets you from a perspective of a significant issue. Very good. I'm going to switch gears now. Um, I want to talk about a little bit, I want us to talk about significance determination processes. Um, and so I'm going to start uh, with the NRC. Uh, the, the question is, on occasion, the SRAs uh, in some regions will default to higher significance determinations using very conservative assumptions when there's an absence of technical input and certainty from the inspection team. That's the context for the question. What efforts do the regions undertake to ensure consistent use of technical inputs and PRA processes to ensure predictability and consistency of outcomes between the regions? And then. For our uh, industry counterparts, similarly, um, 
uh, interactions with sites during the significance determinations produce assumptions in a wide, with a wide range of quality. Uh, what level of quality and data and assumptions for risk analyses is appropriate for input, for input and decisions regarding regulatory response uh, to licensees' performance? So, again, a focus question on SDPs. Mark, do you want to take that one? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, I'd offer, uh, since I arrived in uh, Region 4 about 18 months ago, I've had the opportunity to uh, be involved in some rather uh, challenging uh, significance determination processes. Uh, uh, you know, dealing with uh, flooding deficiencies and uh, some of the some other uh, challenging events, and uh, I would offer that our preliminary uh, risk significance determinations they're based on the best available information at the time the determination is performed. And if you, in the absence of specific technical information, we look at conservative assumptions, and those may need to be applied. Uh, but uh, to ensure at least some consistent application, uh, when we conduct a phase three assessment, uh, that is a peer reviewed uh, senior reactor analyst, uh, let's say in region four, is conducting a, a preliminary risk determination. That uh, result is peer reviewed. And then for any uh, preliminarily uh, greater than green findings, uh, we receive a second analysis performed by the program office of. Uh, I think it's the Division of Risk Analysis, DRA, in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. And then the results of that are discussed at our <laughs> Significant Enforcement Review Panel, or uh, SERP, uh, and we ensure that we uh, reach consensus on what should be the appropriate uh, agency conclusion prior to uh, issuing that preliminary finding. And then as part of our process, there is the opportunity for a licensee to uh, communicate uh, their perspective regarding the uh, uh, risk assessment. And, and many times in developing our preliminary uh, risk assessment, uh, our senior reactor analysts, the inspectors are fully aware of the views uh, and assumptions that are being used by the licensee's uh, PRA uh, 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 specialist. And the other thing is that uh, the senior reactor analysts uh, uh, are in frequent communication with each other and their counterparts in the program office to ensure they share uh, any uh, specific learnings, their monthly teleconference calls, uh, in their uh, semi-annual uh, counterpart meetings, and that's all in the vein of uh, ensuring sufficient knowledge transfer. But uh, when you're dealing with uncertainty, uh, you may have to resort to use of qualitative factors when you can't determine, uh, make a specific a point estimate there on, uh, either, say, initiating event frequency. Uh, and uh, the manual chapter 0305 allows you to use qualitative factors. And, and when you do enter into use of qualitative factors, clearly there is subjectivity that enters into that. But uh, we try and apply the guidance to the best of our ability and ensure we're sharing the approach that we're exercising uh, with uh, risk analysts and peers uh, to ensure to the best of our ability that there is a consistent application. Okay. Joe, do you want to take that one also? Uh, clearly consistent application is the challenge for all of us. And, you know, the, the real challenge when you get into some of these SDPs is how do you get the high quality data combined with the timeliness of pulling that data together so that you have the right the right discussions going on at the right time. And uh, we come from the perspective in the industry, I think, as the regulator does it, the quality of the data, the assumptions, and what we know about those assumptions when we're doing the SDP is the key to our success. And I think it's very important in those conversations to know, you know, how close and how much you believe in each of the assumptions <coughs> and what's really behind them. So the high quality data is very important. And I think the open interaction between what the utilities find in SDP space and those assumptions and what the SRAs are doing is very important to consistently get to the right answer. Hey, Mike. Yes, Randy. I'm sorry. Thank you, Joe. Yes, Mark. J just one quick uh, additional perspective to offer. I, I think we face challenges with the timeliness of uh, SDP determinations, particularly when you're dealing with uh, an issue where you're looking at what's the appropriate credit for recovery actions. And uh, I know we're working with the program office to uh, improve our guidance there and look at uh, delivering an SDP result uh, in as timely a manner as we can, because I think it can be challenging to communicate to members of the public if you have an event and then you look at the length of time it takes before the agency delivers their final risk uh, significance determination. 
uh, it, you end up uh, being challenged and having to explain, well, here is the reactive inspection we conducted to ensure the public health and safety was not at risk uh, during that period of time while we're finalizing the risk significance. But I don't think we do ourselves a service there when it is, a, a, you know, a year after the initiating of event uh, that we're trying to determine the significance of the performance deficiency when we deliver that final result. And there are a number of factors that can contribute to those unique situations. But I think you know, working with the uh, industry to make sure we fully understand the assumptions that they would offer should be used and communicating the assumptions that we use in our risk assessment and reaching closure on that uh, risk determination in as timely a manner as we can, I think serves the public well in ensuring that we're communicating a consistent safety message. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, that, you know, there's been a, a lot of growth in this area for quite a while. The, the subjective areas of how you apply human performance factors and all uh, has always been an, uh, an area that, w that seems to be one of the toughest. And we're going to add to that now that we have added a lot more equipment, or by the end of this year we'll have the flex equipment available for trained operators and others to use. Uh, so this area of subjective uh, use of and the human performance factors and all is certainly an area. I've got now I have equipment. I expect my people to use it. How are we going to credit those and all? And I know Mark and I have had some discussion in this yes. area, and, and, and uh, so we're in. We got a lot of beyond design bases of equipment that people are going to be functionally trained on, and and how to appropriately uh, credit that is going to be a, an interesting area. And it's in an area that we've had many discussions with yes. in the past and disagreements. And, Thank you, Randy. I'm not going to let Mark talk on that issue. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please do, Scott. It's not on. All right, it's on. So I'm Scott Morris. I represent the uh, Division of Inspection and Regional Support at NRR, and uh, many of the topics that the uh, panel has addressed today fall into our wheelhouse, uh, clearly. Uh, and SDP is certainly one of them, significant determination process. So I just wanted to just to uh, let the folks know in the room I know the panel probably knows this, but the commission has actually directed the staff to uh, tell them, or for us to tell them what we're doing to enhance the SDP. And, and the words they use in their direction was to streamline the SDP, uh, which mean, to me means efficiency, uh, among other things. So we're doing that. We, we completed a um, business process improvement initiative about a year ago, looking at the existing process to try to find ways to tune up the uh, existing process uh, to, you know, mitigate some of the challenges that Mark mentioned and others. So, um, in addition, um, we are, and, and we'll be given opportunities to interact with the, uh, the industry and the public on the direction we think we need to go with respect to uh, streamlining the SDP. That's a near-term activity. So, and, and to, uh, to, to Randy's point, I would just mention that we're also fully engaged in an effort to assess the, the how to incorporate things that are captured, uh, mitigation equipment for beyond design basis events, but also um, things that are already required to be incorporated as a consequence of what was formerly known as B5B equipment, uh, but now 5054HH2 equipment. So. All those things are under consideration of the myriad of activities that we're working on to enhance the program. This is one that's very important to us and central and I think key to the process moving forward. So, thanks. Thank you, Scott. thought you were going to ask a question. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, this next question, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. The question is, can each of you comment on the usefulness of regular of regional utility group meetings, and uh, including whether you personally attend. So RUG meetings, uh, how useful are they and do you attend? Mark, do you want to start? Yes, uh, I've had the opportunity to attend uh, two uh, RUG meetings uh, since uh, I assume my responsibilities as regional administrator, and I uh, view those as a highly uh, valuable forum for uh, communication exchange uh, to understand issues of concern uh, on the part of uh, uh, the industry as represented by the uh, regulatory assurance managers that attend. Uh, so I personally attend, and if I'm not able to attend, uh, the deputy regional administrator attends. In fact, we have a RUG meeting coming up 
on uh, April 1st, and I'll be uh, accompanying one of the commissioners uh, to a couple plants that week. Uh, and so my Deputy Regional Administrator, uh, Chris Kennedy, is supporting that RUG meeting. Uh, we actively reach out to make sure we understand what topics uh, the uh, representatives uh, would like us to address. So I think they're a very uh, valuable and important uh, communication exchange. So I fully support uh, that uh, initiative. We, too, have uh, RUG meetings in Region 3. I would say we're going through a bit of an evolution uh, to try to make them even more valuable. Uh, we've had kind of, I'd say, a, a bit of a mix in our history in, in how those have gone. And so there's a concerted effort on both the industry part and the region's part to make those more valuable experiences. Um, it's typically supported by our division directors. Um, myself or my deputy may go periodically, uh, but we've added another type of meeting to our mix that I think is proving to be quite, um, quite valuable, and that's a meeting at, at my level with the site vice presidents. And so we have kind of a, a bit of a mix, and I know other regions do some of this as well. Uh, but that combination I do think provides a valuable opportunity for interchange and feedback. So I think similar to uh, regions four and three, um, Region 2 supports uh, regulatory users group meetings at least twice a year. And uh, similarly, we meet with the plant managers, Region 2 plant managers. At one point, we were doing a Region 1, 2 uh, plant managers meeting a couple of times a year, either in Region 2 or Region 1. Um, and uh, we, uh, I meet with the site vice presidents. And I guess to the question of the level of participation, I, if I can't attend, one of my uh, deputies uh, participates in that valuable opportunity for sharing. The, the moose is proverbially always on the table, so any issues uh, that are, are, are relevant uh, are brought up, and, and um, the feedback is, is always uh, is usually positive. Uh, so we, we, we really look forward and, to and value those, those sessions. I guess I didn't realize they even had proverbial moose in Georgia. Yeah, <laughs> there are. <laughs> uh, ha having been in the job for three months, I, I have a 100% record of going to one out of one uh, rug meeting since I've been there. I found it to be a, a very valuable conversation, and, and I expect that I will continue uh, either myself or my deputy uh, participating in those, uh, in those meetings. I think it's a, it's a good dialogue. Uh, at the re at the reg assurance level, uh, and I also uh, agree with the comments that were made about you know, routinely meeting with the site vice presidents, and 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 uh, I also at at the rug meeting that I did participate in, uh, in encouraging open communications, also uh, support uh, fleet meetings uh, because at this point we have a number of fleets that 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 touch uh, several of us. Yeah, Mike. The only thing I'd add is that at those same meetings, uh, we always invite uh, an NRR representative or an INSA representative, uh, and they typically show up, and oftentimes they do more sharing than, uh, than the regions do because of the importance of the initiatives uh, ongoing now in the agency. So again, a valuable opportunity to share. Yeah, I believe any time we can have uh, open professional communications, talking about our industry and the challenges. Uh, I've had participated in the past. I get briefed on some of them now whenever issues are, are there. I think they're a great opportunity, and if anything, I would just encourage us to be aware of our young and up and coming and add a few more to these meetings who can get exposure at, at this time now uh, while we're still around. Very good. Yeah, and I would agree with Randy. I think they're vital exchanges of information. I would encourage it. There's probably opportunities to keep some of the more challenging issues in front of those groups and talk about resolution paths, um, you know, especially on some of those long-standing issues that we all, all have in front of us. Just another forum for that kind of dialogue. Thank you, Joe. And, and uh, as Vic reminds me, we have also another, I think, valuable opportunity to meet in terms of uh, the meeting that we have uh, with the industry chief nuclear officers uh, with us on NSIAC, uh, those meetings where we have an opportunity to share uh, information, uh, raise issues that, are, uh, that need to be focused on. So that's just another example of uh, a really good opportunity for us to get together and, and uh, make sure that we're making progress on issues that are important. 
I've got a number of questions. These are, I, incidentally, I just got to tell you, the audience, audience is raising great questions. Usually, you get two or three throwaways that you don't dare ask, right? <laughs> Haven't gotten any throwaways. I've, my, my problem is, my problem is getting Mark to finish quickly enough so I can get on to the next question. <laughs> I think we're noting a substantive cross-cutting issue trend here. <laughs> uh, but actually, Mark, I, I do have a question that I'd like you and Dan to field, and it relates to the, the songs, uh, lessons learned activity that we've uh, been engaged in, and, and uh, it's not uh, yet, I think, been publicly available, but it certainly is wrapped up. And a couple aspects to that I'd like you guys to talk to. One is, uh, and, and these are questions, um, one relates to uh, the 5059 reviews and the weaknesses in those 5059 reviews. And so, Dan, I know uh, you did a lot with that before you left uh, uh, NRR deputy to go to Region 1. So if you could just talk about that a little bit, and then, Mark, if you could talk about the inspection program changes or, or inspection program changes that would be conceivable based on uh, that activity. So please. Yeah, so there's uh, a, a number of issues, 5059, uh, related to songs and some not related to songs. Um, the, the, the underlying issue, songs replaced steam generators, they did it under 5059. Uh, one of the generators in Unit 3 failed, tubes failed uh, halfway through the first cycle. Uh, raised questions about the, the, the adequacy of the 5059 review and, uh, it, that was done, as well as questions about, you know, did Region 4 miss something in looking at the 5059s. Uh, I, I think ultimately the staff's conclusion was that uh, there was a, a, a green finding cited against the, the 5059 evaluation, but that the root cause of the, of the problems with the generator were design control issues, not, not a 5059 issue fundamentally. Um, IG looked into that. Uh, they uh, had some, some broader perspective in their, in their report on, on some uh, issues that they put on the table that I would characterize as, as open questions about other aspects of the 5059 that the staff had not dug into in their inspection activity, uh, which also feeds into the question of do, are we giving the inspectors the right uh, guidance in the 5059 inspection procedures uh, in, in looking at uh, st licensees, screenings and evaluations, but also uh, there was also a question of, of is there something unique about a large component like a steam generator versus other components. And uh, so all of this was folded into uh, our Songs Lessons Learned project that Mike alluded to. Uh, the the uh, EDO provided direction to NRR, NRO, uh, who has the vendor oversight component of it, and Region 4 uh, to look at a, a range of issues related to the Songs experience in the 5059 and inspection of 5059 was an important component of that. And during that Lessons Learned review, the IG report came out, and so evaluation of the IG report got folded into that effort. Um, so I think the bottom line, there, as, as Mike alluded, there, there is a, a draft report. I think it's close to being finalized. Uh, I, I think there are some things that we can improve in, in the uh, oversight of 5059, but fundamentally the staff concluded that 5059 itself is sound. Uh, it, it is appropriate for uh, large component replacement. It doesn't really, 5059 is agnostic on how big the component is. It's really how does the component affect uh, the safety margins in the licensing basis of the plant. Uh, in, and, and it's important to may point out that 5059 is not a safety determinant. 5059 is a decision-making tool relative to whether a licensee needs prior NRC approval before implementing a change. Uh, and there are specific criteria laid out in the, in the, uh, in, in the 5059 rule and expounded upon in, in guidance that was developed by NEI and endorsed by the staff uh, many years ago. Uh, and, and it has been a very effective tool in ensuring that both the industry and the staff are focusing our attention on the most safety significant issues. So I, I, I don't think you'll see fundamental shifts coming out of the songs, uh, lessons learned activity in the area of 5059. I think you will see areas for improvement uh, in, in our staff training on 5059 uh, and, and in how we 
uh, look at 5059s, and, and and it's both in the inspection piece and also uh, for the for the things that a licensee evaluates under 5059 and concludes that they can go ahead and make that change without prior NRC approval. They are required to provide an annual report of those changes uh, and and how we how we review that report when it comes in, as well as the associated changes to their FSARs uh, that are required to be updated. So so uh, I I think there are improvements coming as a result of the songs effort um, I, I think there are improvements on on the margins and in the implementation of it okay mark you'll have the last answer yeah thanks and I will attempt to be succinct here I only have three <laughs> quick points here uh, obviously uh, as Dan indicated uh, there were some learnings regarding uh, uh, our review of the licensees uh, 50.59 evaluations and learnings uh, communicated uh, from the uh, uh, office of the inspector general's perspective and the uh, views that were uh, delivered by uh, those that were responding to the uh, 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 Songs Lessons Learned Tasking Memo. Clearly there will be a change to or enhancement of uh, a guidance, inspection guidance regarding uh, our uh, review of a 5059 product. I think uh, we would be looking at ensuring we had uh, uh, experienced inspectors that have had, you know, have had the opportunity to review uh, 5059s uh, fairly extensively. Uh, I, there also will be a, a change to the, uh, I'll call it, entry criteria for when you might conduct a vendor inspection. I think historically those vendor inspections have been reactive in nature uh, when there has been an issue identified and there will be some uh, uh, enhancement regarding a guidance for when you could initiate a, a vendor inspection. Uh, uh, and also some guidance regarding uh, when uh, it may be appropriate to conduct a more detailed evaluation for a large component replacement like a reactor vessel or a steam generator and leveraging the various procedures that we have. If the region in coordination with the program office thinks that uh, there's some unique aspects that would warrant a more comprehensive review uh, than just looking at the uh, 5059 evaluation. Thank you. Thanks. Good. Uh, good set of questions, a great set of answers. I got to tell you, I've, I have some I didn't get to. Uh, there's one that asks about timelines for some of the things that we talked about in terms of the ROP enhancements and when those things will roll out, we'll uh, get that answered. There's a question about uh, substantive cross-cutting issues and uh, uh, that meeting and what came out of that meeting, what was committed to, and so we'll get an answer up to that question up on the web page. Um, there are a couple of questions actually in different handwriting. I was actually wondering whether someone was, had, was getting a little frustrated that I hadn't asked this question and so wrote a second question, but I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Um, uh, this question really deals with pre-GDC pre plants and, and uh, issues around our knowledge uh, related to pre uh, GDC plants and yep. and uh, our approach to resolution of those issues and so uh, another set of questions that we'll get answers to up on the web page and then finally uh, there's a question about um, the reactor oversight process and and uh, sort of the the initial setup of that process which which really allowed 30 days to complete a root cause and and uh, but a part of that root cause is is uh, maybe uh, um, benefited by having the NRCs. Uh, an indication of the NRC's violation, and so it talks about the timeliness of those issues as they roll out, uh, and ha as we originally intended it uh, in the original ROP as we set it up. So um, you'll, you'll see the full question, you'll see that question answered on the web page. I apologize for not getting to those. I think we had a full set of questions, again, and a, and a great set of answers to those questions. I do want to, uh, in closing, uh, thank, of course, the, uh, the panel uh, coordinator, Rob. He's very, uh, he's very disappointed that I mentioned his name. Um, I want to thank the panel, the very distinguished panel. Um, good answers again. Uh, thank you for your time and your answers. And I want to thank the audience, of course, uh, for being attentive and asking great questions. So please, uh, we're free. you're free to go. Please enjoy the rest of the evening.